Hi everybody, welcome to Amy Nolte Music. I'm pretty excited today to shoot this video because in a little bit over a week, I'm gonna have a single come out and it's the first piece of music for me to put out in, oh, since about 2009. So that's a long time, like nine years. And this time I had this idea that I'd like to kind of bring you on a journey with me. Since I've built this YouTube channel, and it's about music and music education, I'd like to try to show you the process a little bit of this single for me. So, let's do it. This is how The Loveliest Girl came to be. I didn't write this song. It was a song called For All the Girls I've Ever Loved by Matt Clark, my friend. Matt is a wonderful singer. He's actually got a pretty great YouTube channel. It's a little dormant, but if you look it up, you'll enjoy it. He sings, uh, he sings and plays guitar and he writes his own songs and sings a lot of great covers. He sent this to me maybe three or four years ago and I heard it just on his SoundCloud and I fell in love with it. I'm not gonna give away much of it today but I want you to hear a little bit of how it sounded. Take a listen. Spending afternoons together A string of days with perfect weather Far too nice to stay inside Lying in the grass, I looked up at her sitting next to me. Now the thing that I loved most about this song was the story, the lyric, the concept. Like I said, I'm, I'm not giving that away today. I, I really feel like that'll be a cool part for you to experience in the moment when you hear the single. But I do want to let you know how I was able to take this song that just started with Matt singing and playing his guitar and make it into something a little more. This single will kick off my album, which I hope will be out before the end of the year. And on this album, I really want to explore some new possibilities. I would like to take my jazz sensibilities and knowledge and just use them in whatever way comes out. A wonderful article in Downbeat Magazine a couple of months ago where Eric Reed was interviewed and he said, I needed to step outside of who I was told that I should be and simply express an artistic point of view without putting a label on it. I got free, I grew up, and I constantly tell young musicians, look, do what you love to do. Who cares what it's called? Do you like doing it? And does it bring joy to other people? Go ahead and just do it. That was kind of an answer for me to a question I'd been asking myself. And I just decided that I can make more than just a piano trio or a guitar and piano and vocals because I've got a lot inside of me that wants to come out. And this song by Matthew Clark just kept coming back to me. It was like it wouldn't leave me. And I thought, I definitely have to make something out of this song. And I did it fast. It became this idea that like grew so big in my heart. It, I, couldn't, I couldn't ignore it or let go of it. And I had to make it happen quickly. So, Here's the idea. I arrange for woodwind quartet. Once in a while, a quintet, mostly a quartet. At one point, uh, whatever 11 voices is. But um, woodwinds, I heard it on this song. I wanted to write in some kind of a chamber music kind of way, some kind of orchestral scoring for smaller group. And this jumped out at me. So I wanted to just sit at the piano and live with it a little bit. I'd like to take you on that journey with me. I decided I'd like to introduce the instruments one at a time so everybody could hear them. And the instruments that I thought I would start with would be flute, clarinet, clarinet, and bass clarinet. So two clarinets, but I, I quickly changed my mind um, as I realized that I really wanted to use an alto flute. I love the alto flute. So I, I decided, how about if I introduce every note up on the dominant, on the five? So I'm gonna put this song in C instead of G like Matt had it. What if every note played the same G in the same octave and we heard it in stereo, coming across the stereo field right across our heads in the earbuds or earphones? Like that. That's what I thought. Every, every instrument, boom, 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 boom. And then it just kind of came to me to go. It 
just kind of came and that's always nice when that happens. So I thought, nice, we'll land on this four chord. It's beautiful. And this could be an introduction. Right? We hang out there for a second. And then I thought, let's do something like that again, but a little bit different. And the idea came to me that I've used before in my writing to, to make this beautiful major one chord using the five, the seven, the one and the three in that order from top to bottom. That way you get the nice rub right in the middle. And then the flute does a pickup to do the same exact thing. Everybody plays a da 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 da. And then we go to the four chord again, but maybe this time with just a little bit of longing. So the sharp 11 here in the alto flute. After that, I wanted it to be like I was playing piano, but I wanted those four instruments to act as the piano for me. So I started messing around with voicings, and I knew that my first chords were A minor and E minor. So just a straight A minor and E minor would be like this. Spending afternoons together. But I didn't like how that sounded. I wanted to add some dissonance, some beautiful voice leading and nice spreads. So I've got like that, an A minor nine, we'll call it, with the one, the five, the nine, and the three in that order, starting from bottom to top. And that's nice. Spending afternoons together. And here we put an E minor chord. Root position. Railroad tracks for a long break. I decided I wanted all of this to be really rubato and conducted. Same chord, a string of days, but this we're going to drop the bass clarinet with perfect weather. And I knew my next chord was D minor. And I always like, if I'm going from one minor chord to another and they're a whole step apart, oftentimes I will make a leading tone in every voice to just drop a half step so that for a split second, we've got E flat minor seven. So I made it a five, four bar. Spending afternoons together. A string of days with perfect weather, far too nice. And I realize that's not strictly a bar of 5-4, but since this was going to be rubato, it didn't matter so much. And since I wasn't going to hire four different instrumentalists to come in and play their instruments because I don't have the budget for that, I hired one man, his name's Doug Webb, and he brought all of his axes in and he had to overdub everything. So to do that very rubato was not going to work unless I had a click track. So we made one. We had it about here. Boom. About there. And what we did was very quickly on his music, we just sketched in how many clicks there were for every bar. Take for instance the bass clarinet part. Bass clarinet's the last one to enter. So by the time he was gonna come in with what is actually a high A for the bass clarinet, here it is, boom, listen. He could hear all three parts. He knew when that note came in, but he could hear the clicks as well. We counted three, four, five, six off, or however many it ended up being. And we did that all through the beginning section, clicks, so that it could be overdubbed. When Matt wrote this song, it was spending afternoons together, a string of days with perfect weather, D minor right here, far too nice to stay inside with an F major chord. Um, well, he did it in another key, but it's the four major chord. I heard one more chord in there. I'll show you how it went. Ah, oh, and on the D minor chord, we call it a D minor 11. We've got the one, the three, the 11, and the seven. Far too nice to, really dark to me. Stay inside. Again, I bring back that sharp 11 from before in the intro. This time it happens in the clarinet voice. And then here, like an A flat major 13. Again, one last time I wanted to bring the instruments in one at a time. And so 
We did like this. The flute has a simple melody that goes down as I sing. Lying in the grass, I looked up at him sitting next to me. That's a very melodic part, right? Just going down. The alto flute answers. After that, the clarinet comes in. Lying in the grass, I looked up at him sitting next to me. And I'm bringing back this chord that I love, this C major seven chord in first inversion. Let's hear how it sounds with the bass clarinet. Now, I don't know what chord I'd call this, and it doesn't even matter. I mean, I could call it, you know, a few different things, but I didn't even really think of it. I kind of thought of the melody in each voice and the way that it lined up together. And we've got, we've got a lot of fourths going on with this too, which I always really enjoy. Um, so, lying in grass I looked up at him sitting next to me and there's that chord again and then I'm not gonna tell you more words I'm gonna sing la 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 for you because like I said I don't want to give too much of it away then we have an effect that I like to use often in my piano playing it sounds like this it's what I call the outer voices against the inner voices. I actually have a whole video on this. I'll link to it above. But it's a wonderful way to, uh, to accompany yourself or to accompany someone else in a bossa nova kind of style. And I just thought I'd throw it in here to give us some movement. At this point, we're done with the click. It's no longer very rubato. And I also had a scratch vocal that I sang along. So um, the first time when I conducted the flute, I sang a scratch vocal. After that, we counted clicks. And then I have these wonderful open chords. We've got a we've got fifth here in the lower voices, and then we move to a sixth and then a sixth, a parallel sixth. A uh, parallel sixth starting in the top, and then a perfect fourth. With another railroad track, as I say, then he told me the story. We've got an octave for all four of the voices. Everybody gets quieter and the acoustic guitar enters. This is where the second half of the song happens, and it's where a lot of the magic of the song happens. So I'm not gonna talk very much about it, except for to tell you that at this point in the song, everything changes. This part is special to me. This is, this is more woodwind, and um, I have, this is the lowest note the bass clarinet hits, and you'll find that it, its effect is very strong um, in the song, maybe maybe the strongest point of the song, when the woodwinds re-enter after being out for a while. And there's a tenth between that bass clarinet and the clarinet. And then there's another tenth between the, the clarinet and the alto flute. It's wide open, and then a fifth on top. And when I was writing, you know, I just played piano and tried to think of how each voice would sound. And that works for me. I, piano is so natural for me. And if I, if I try hard to think about the timbre of all of the instruments, I think I can play the piano in a different way than I normally do. I wouldn't normally play piano in this way. I normally wouldn't come up with that. But when I thought of each individual voice on its own, it came out. I, I knew I, I wanted to have a m beautiful moving, just slur lines up the yin yang, everybody just play, phrasing their parts beautifully on this part. So I thought of this lovely uh, melody. And I knew I wanted it echoed in the next voice down. So alto flute echoes it. 
but alto flute isn't the only one that echoes. The clarinet echoes as well, but a tenth below. But with its own melody line, not, it's not an exact replication. It, you know, it comes in, but it has its own melody line, so it would be beautiful to sing if I was singing the clarinet part. I'll let you hear it just a tiny bit. Yeah, and all the bass clarinet has to do is sit there on a low C, and it's pretty magical, I think. This is also one of my favorite parts. I've got a huge spread between the bass clarinet and the clarinet. It's two octaves and one. They do this, just like that. And the way I came up with it was because I wanted, at this point, I wanted some falling motion in these top instruments. Let me sing you the melody. Let me back up just a little bit. Da -da 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 -da. My cascade and the top voices are gonna do this. And I've got a C for my melody. And once I figured that I wanted those moving sixths, I loved the way they sounded so much, I wanted something else. So I dropped a perfect fifth from that alto flute with the clarinet because I wanted it to sound so bright, even over the D minor chord. on to the C right there. And I think it's a marvelous effect. The last note resolves here, but then just for a second before everything builds, and I put everybody on this D4 right in the middle of the piano, and I wanted some contrary motion, I wanted movement. You can see the middle voices end up kind of staying around the same, but my idea was a contrary motion kind of idea. And I heard this line, That's where I started from. So I had to harmonize that melody line. I thought, what do I want for the low line? Because I knew that those middle voices could just about be anything, but the low line and the high line needed to be very important. They needed to be very strong. So I sang something. Da -da 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 -da. I thought, that's nice. I mean, that's just a sixth between the top and bottom voices. I wonder how I can come up with something for the middle. So I just started playing. That was nice. All I had to do was kind of hold tight on that D for the alto flute and then thirds, and then for the clarinet. I actually went right up against that alto flute and we had really tight dissonance the whole way because that is something that I would play on the piano. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't sure how it was gonna work, but I closed my eyes and I imagined it and it felt good to me, so I kept it. Let's hear it. <laughs> opens up at the end, as you can hear. We've got a sixth in the bottom. We keep that tight dissonance of a, of a whole step between the two inner voices. And we've got, it's a D minor seven chord, so we've got five, three, 11, and seven. Beautiful. We don't even need the D. The bass player's gonna play the D on there. The last part of the song is a pyramid. And at this point, I think I'll talk about the stereo field. Now, I'm not letting you hear very much of it, but uh, the acoustic guitar, but the acoustic guitar does a picking pattern throughout that needs to just sit in our ears and be a constant. There's no percussion in this song at all. The acoustic guitar actually serves as percussion in a way, constant eighth notes that just run and run and run and run. And I wanted to have that very spread out, much like I would my piano if I was recording piano. So we panned the guitar hard left and hard right. My friend Jason Neubauer recorded guitar for this song remotely. He lives up in, uh, by Niagara Falls, and he recorded this for me and sent it. 
And that was a really special part of this too, because uh, Jason and I have only played together in real life once in this very special video that I'll link to right here, uh, where we met at Niagara Falls and opened the hatchback of his car where he created this little, uh, this little little booth for us to record in, and we played a blues tune. Anyway, I love Jason's playing, and I wanted it to sound gorgeous. So he he made a very nice stereo recording of his guitar, sent it to me, and we plugged it in. Uh, after that, in the stereo field, we've got the piano left and the piano right, right above. We have the two inner voices be kind of toward the outer part of our heads, We've got clarinet on the left, alto flute on the right, bass clarinet right above that, and flute right above that. And then right panned up the middle are the vocals and the bass. So I just kind of took a guess about these things where I thought I would like to hear these instruments in the stereo field. I ran it by my engineer and he said, that looks really good, Amy, let's go for it. And I don't think he really tweaked it. I think that's where we ended up. I did, however, leave the next part to my engineer, David, David Peters at Oakwood Studios in Altadena. He's absolutely wonderful for miking all of these woodwind instruments. I wanted a flute pyramid on this last part of the song. I'll give away a tiny bit. Uh, they needed to represent points of light everywhere. So I have this B flat major Lydian sound that I know needs to happen. <laughs> We've got these kind of hits happening in the guitar and the piano, and also with the other voices. I've got bass clarinet, clarinet, alto flute, and flute um, hitting these. And actually, we brought in the bass flute here as well, just to have a deeper texture. But these do the hits. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. These are fifths. Super bright. We're talking about light. So I've, I've built from the C, you know. I've got a C, a G, and a D. That's so beautiful. And then we do, uh, we do the same kind of thing on the C major chord. So, so that was a B flat chord. I just put them in a different order. You can look at them as fourths or fifths, but in this context, they sound like fifths to me. And then I move them to here so that we get this beautiful kind of sound over the C major chord. Right? Fifths. Just in a different order. And I wanted, I wanted the B-flat to definitely sound Lydian. Um, so I started with the sharp 11. And we have these notes for the flute. Those are all notes over B-flat major 7. And then we do the same kind of movement, but over C major 7. I just made it a little backwards at the end instead of going so those those repeat and we'll hear them twice i'll let you hear them right now my next step was actually to look up and make sure that all of these instruments could hit all of these notes there were a couple places where I had to go back and make a couple of changes. I actually don't remember what they were anymore, but all you have to do is Google range of a bass clarinet. It'll tell you what the range is. It'll tell you how to notate. I mean, it's very interesting, bass clarinet especially. Let's look at this section at, uh, oh, what it is, letter C in my music, and I wanted the bass clarinet on that very low C. That's C2 on the piano. But for the clarinet, the, clar the bass clarinet reads in treble clef. So that's a lot of ledger lines, but we have one, two, three, four ledger lines. That's a D, a low D to the clarinet. So every note for the bass, sorry, bass clarinet, every note is a ninth above where it should be written. And in the key signature above, so instead of being in the key of C, everything's in the key of D, which is just, you know, the same as any B flat instrument. It's just an octave displaced, really, an octave and a step. Whereas the clarinet itself 
is only a step displaced. Let's look at letter C for the alto flute so you can see about how to notate an alto flute. The note in the alto flute in my score is G4. Sounds like that. On an alto flute, if I want it to sound like that, I need to write it a perfect fourth above. The alto flute is pitched in the key of G, so everything needs to be a perfect fourth up. We're writing in the key of F, even though it's the key of C. So to get that sound that I wanted on a G4, I had to write it as a C5 for the alto flute. And then a flute is super, super easy. Everything is just as it sounds. The C flute, beautiful. Um, uh, a couple places I, I had it going just as low as it could possibly go. I have it playing a middle C or a C4. And so, I knew that that was going to be ultra quiet, and that was okay. I just made sure every other part was quiet as well. The only other thing left for me to do was to write a piano part, which I did not do. The score was good enough for me. I kind of knew, I wrote little notes for myself. There were a few places where I needed cues. For the most part, I just wanted to feel that piano part. And then I just wrote a bass part out. My bass player uh, was wonderful. Bruce Lett came to play, and Bruce, was very sensitive, which is what I needed from him. I knew I didn't need um, a huge bass part. I said, I had to tell him a couple of times, no, Bruce, don't add anything. I've written it just the way I want it. And he would say, okay, okay. Very humble dude, which is always appreciated. Um, at first, he really wanted to add a lot of notes, and I just needed so many whole notes from him. Doom, doom, doom. Just like that, just like super boring bass part. But it's beautiful when it's in there. I'm so excited about it, you guys. It will drop soon. And if you want to know the date, follow me on my social media. All the social media, I'll have it up on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And for the first week, it will be available only for download. iTunes, Amazon, Google Play Store. After a week, it'll be everywhere. And I'll have a little music video for you as well. Um, I'm excited too because my son Louis made the artwork for it. I'll appreciate it so much if, um, if you see fit to uh, drop the dollar on the download for me. And after that, if you don't want to pay the dollar, it's okay. Everybody will have it everywhere for free streaming and it'll be on the YouTube channel as well. I'm so excited to bring it to you everybody and, uh, and to bring you the rest of the album as the year goes on. I'll probably do one more single. And, um, and then the rest of the album before the year's out. It'll be new stuff, you know? Some of it won't be like what you heard from me before. And um, it doesn't mean that that stuff won't happen again, but I feel like I've got a lot of stuff that's been brewing in me that needs to come out, as simple as that. And this is the first piece, the first piece of that puzzle. I think you're really gonna like it. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on Amy Nolte Music.